those spiritual baddies, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. You're listening to the Embodiment Podcast, where we dig into who you are behind closed doors. And even if you aren't an entrepreneur or on your spiritual journey, but you're looking for something to listen to while you're on the treadmill, or on the road, or just looking for some new knowledge to gain, welcome. I'm your co-host, Ashley Fry. And I'm Manote Series. Welcome back to Embodiment, who you are behind closed doors. Today, we have a special guest. Um, extremely special extremely all the way from bc all the way from bc we were able to catch him in person um cameron manning so (laughs) before we jump into anything uh do you want to give us just a little bit of a rundown on who you are what your story is sure um so i guess uh my name is cameron (laughs) for those who get already um uh, i Originally from Alberta, so I grew up and born and raised in Edmonton, uh, just outside Edmonton, and moved to BC back in 2013, where I actually got an opportunity to connect with Ashley's mom and started working with her actually as an executive assistant, which has led to the career that I've had now for over a decade in the real estate industry. Um, I focus on a lot of work with helping people build their wealth through understanding the power of owning real estate. Yeah. And uh, that's actually what we're here doing right Right now. now. We're actually at a conference in in Toronto, and that's why I got to sit down and chat with you guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of like a real quick rundown. I've been doing that for 10 years now and had to look back, love every day of it. And how did you, uh, refresh my memory, how did you uh, end up meeting? It's a good question, actually. Um, So kind of taking it back a little bit even before that, um, my mom was a very entrepreneurial person. She was always doing like different network marketing businesses and things like that. And I got started doing those when I was about 16 myself. I started my first network marketing business. And for me, it just wasn't something I really enjoyed doing was those styles. So I was looking for something new. Yeah. And I heard a radio ad for Rich Dad Education. Okay. And uh, went to the three free hour preview, then went to the class and then signed up for their bigger packages. And uh, someone who I'd met through the courses was actually being mentored by your mom. Okay. And yeah, as, this was back in 2013. So this had been before 2013, actually, uh, 2011, actually. Okay. And so he says, you need to go meet my mentor. Her name's Kelly. She's probably going to be at the back of the room at your next class in Calgary. Make sure you go introduce yourself. Yeah. So I go and introduce myself. I'm like, you know, hey, you know, David asked me to say hi. And you're like, your mom was just so tired from the mentoring. Right. Like it was like, oh, <laughs> hi. Nice to meet you. OK. Right. Like that yeah. kind of conversation. Right. I like I'm sure you've seen some of those days. Right. This, this business knocks out of you. Uh, so it was two years later yeah. that um, I actually had an ex who was moving to Vancouver okay. and I convinced her to buy and Kelly had just gotten licensed. And so my coach and mentor said, you should call Kelly I said, oh, I know Kelly. I met her once yeah, and connected her and my ex's mom yeah. and she helped her buy. And then through the process of me moving here, that's where we really got to know each other a lot more. So okay. well, I and did not know the What was, so getting into real estate, what was that kind of shift in perspective where you decided, okay, this is what I want to do? Like what initiated that? Well, again, I think, um, being that my mom always kind of saw business as like the out from the typical traditional nine to five. Same. Um, Same. <laughs> yeah, totally. For me, the network marketing just wasn't it, right? And I found there was two things for me that I struggled with. One, it was the fact that you have to constantly be buying product, right, to be able to qualify for your income. And two, at like 16 to 18, it's hard to convince your friends to get into these businesses where you got to spend so much money every month. So you're actually kind of targeting their parents and their parents have a negative connotation towards network marketing. Yeah. You know, MLM scams and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when it came to real estate, when I heard the course, my parents had already owned like a couple rentals, but they probably did like everything under the sun wrong, wrong location, bad tenants, like didn't screen. So I'm like, but they tried it once. There's clearly something to it. I'm like, maybe if we go and take these courses and we actually learn how to do it right. Yeah. And so that's more time into it. Yeah. And what I liked about real estate is that I control a lot of my own, you know, destiny with it. Yeah. For lack of a better word. Right. Like I I, put in is what you get out. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I chose real estate at the end of the day. And go ahead. Go ahead. One big question I have, and I feel like a lot of people would also be wondering this. Do you 
Well, this is kind of a, this is probably gonna be a stupid question, but <laughs> there's no stupid. <laughs> do, you, do you invest in real estate? Oh yeah, yeah. How how did you get started doing that? Um, okay, so my first deal is, uh, as they say, you're, it's always your learner deal because you're gonna screw it up. Yeah, <laughs> right. So what ended up happening was I chose the path of doing rent to own because I saw it as an opportunity to be able to do with no money because I was 21 and I had that much money. Yeah. All right. So what ended up happening was um, I started connecting myself with different people, mortgage brokers, putting my systems together, and it just, you know, like most investors, you get kind of stuck with analysis from paralysis. So I'm like, we're like slowly building this up to the point where one of my mortgage brokers I had connected with had said, oh, by the way, I have this person who needs your help. So I was kind of thrust into that first deal, like now I have to do it. And what the situation was, was uh, in Alberta back in 2011, I think it was, um, one of the cities up north, uh, Slave Lake, actually had a massive fire and wiped out a significant area. And so the people that the mortgage broker referred me had lost their home yeah. and they weren't able to buy because they had actually gone through a bankruptcy. Yeah. And so we were in a situation where we could help them get into a home, right? Now, when I say we, it's a learner property, well, I had a joint venture partner lined up who was uh, a family member, but then they backed out last minute. My mom, who was my partner at the time, was a very sensitive individual and she really wanted to help them. And even if it didn't make financial sense. Yeah. Right. And the mortgage broker, being that that was their, her clients originally, she really wanted to help. So she came up. Pressure. Yeah, I was kind of pressured. It. And so we set up a structure that actually didn't end up working. Like I used their down payment, my credit, and we bought the property all together and like co-owned it. Okay. Which didn't work out because when it came time to be bought out, they didn't want to buy me out. They're like, well, we already own the property. We just want you off the title. So, you know, it was a year... Not wasn't really yeah, fair, you know what? Yeah. but you know, that I learned a lot. And so my next deals after that yeah. were way more successful because I made sure that I had my JV partners, you know, everything was lined up. I had proper contracts. I had, you know, proper screening methods. And so from there, I ended up doing several rent to owns in Alberta after that, that were set up way, way better. And then you've started investing in BC now, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. How was it shifting from the market in Alberta to shifting <laughs> to BC? Well, I know your mom could tell this story great too when she said I was in absolute denial on the prices, right? Because when you go from a area like Edmonton to, you know, the lower mainland, the price shock is insane. I I mean, I remember seeing tear down properties that were a million dollars. And I'm like, how on earth can anyone justify a property that needs to be bulldozed at a million dollars? Now, obviously 10 years later, my perspective has vastly changed on the market. But um, it was it was a bit of a shock coming over. But, you know, I started just grinding away, learning the market like anything and had the opportunity right away to start working with your mom. And that really put me right into the deep end in the market. Right. Yeah. Learning how to how this market operates, how it's different, the fundamentals and why it's worth a million dollars. Now, of course, it's worth way more than that now. But yeah, at the good investor when you look back at it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But also just the perspective of taking on. The Gen Z perspective. Yeah. As a Gen Z, looking at the market now, right? Yeah. Everything's so overpriced. Well, overpriced, right? Everything. <laughs> the market is very expensive at this point. And a lot of Gen Z and everything I see that on TikTok, on, on social media, everyone's like, I can't afford a house. I don't know how I'm going to afford a house. Yep. How do you recommend Gen Z go about that decision? Like, how are they supposed to afford I think a lot of Gen Zs have not even thought about doing it. Yeah. Just yeah. Up. They've just given up. So the what biggest couple couple things, actually. So one, you're not going to be buying a house. And that's the biggest misconception. And then the problem stems a lot from the media saying it's like, you can't afford a house. Well, for sure. I mean, a house is $1.5 million. Yeah. Start in a condo. Yeah. Right? Get yourself into the market somewhere. If you have a good paying job, you can afford like a $300,000 one bedroom condo. Mm -hmm. Get into it and start small. You don't have to be in the big six bedroom house right away. Right. The other thing is um, what we've started doing on our team to help our younger Gen Z um, uh, colleagues is we started crowdsourcing deals. So we'll take like a condo, let's say a one bedroom condo for 350000 at a 10% deposit, it's 
right? We'll do it as a pre-sale. Yeah. And we get like five people in on that. We split that 35,000. It's a lot more affordable. And if the market goes up, we flip that property, they get the proceeds of that sale. So there's a few different ways that you can get involved yeah. versus just saying right away, oh, it's expensive. I can't do it. Right. I say, I always say, yeah. find out how. You can't changing the the, the Ch- wording. Change the wording exactly, right? Change the narrative, change the perspective. Exactly. It's, it's like the saying, um, shifting, oh, I can't afford it to I'm gonna figure out how I'm gonna Yeah, afford. how can I afford it? Yeah. Rich said poor dad. Exactly. I re- I remember that that's the one quote that was like highlighted yeah. from that book for me. Oh yeah. At, and I, I would say, you know, even just as the Gen Z, that should be the first starter book you should yeah. all recommend yeah. being read, like or to read. Because to me, that's the foundation of almost every successful real estate investor I know, mm-hmm. right? And and even that, like I may be in the millennial generation, you know, a little bit older, but for me, it started with that book and just getting myself into the market, yeah. right? So yeah. Well, we were talking about it earlier too, th- talking about financial literacy. A lot of our generation, there are some people who know what they're doing and they've done the research. But the general population of Gen Zs have no clue yeah. what they're doing when it comes to credit, when it comes to investing. When it... A lot of them don't have credit. Yeah, true. Don't even have credit. I, I, I'm shocked at how many of my friends I talk to and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to use credit. Yeah. And then they're always like, Devin, I'm like, do you, do you have a credit card? And they're like, no, why would I want debt? Yeah. And I'm like, you gotta have debt to make money. If that ab- makes you money. Well, it's absolutely true. Like you, you have to have credit to be able to build a credit history yeah. Yeah. to be able to then build that wealth, right? You, you can't do anything, do anything. To do anything. But the problem is, is that because, and a lot of it goes back to one, the media and two, just poor training from their parents who've been poor trained from their parents from, you know, it's a generational thing. Yeah. It suddenly is, okay, I don't like debt because my family member X, Y, Z gone to a bad situation and had a bankruptcy. Well, it's because they mismanaged credit. Yeah. You have to have credit and you need to learn how to manage it is the key. Yeah. So, yeah. I told Mano last night when we were driving back from seeing you guys, uh, if and when I date the next guy, I am not telling him how many credit cards I have or how much credit I have. Yeah. I'm just going to take it. She's like, I'm yeah. keeping a secret. She's like, I'm going to see how he reacts. Yeah, totally. And that's the best way to do it, right? I mean, you don't want people to because sometimes when when you even tell people that you have credit and you tell people that you're, you know, credit conscious, they're like, okay, that's sketchy because I because they don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Education is a big part of it. That's a hundred percent. So like that that's what one of the one of the reasons I'm asking so much because yeah. a lot of my friends that listen to the podcast they listen to Kelly's episode yeah. back back when we like at the, when we first started like a while back yeah um almost a year almost a year, almost a year ago is when we had yeah. her on so and again we need to uh, have her on again soon but. A lot of my friends from that episode were like, okay, she was talking about credit, but I still don't understand why, like, okay, sure, it helps me build a history, but why do I need it? Why can't I just use my debit card? Why can't I just... And I was just curious from your perspective, what would you say to those people who still have that struggle of applying for a credit card or finding where to start in their credit card? Okay, so where to start? Really simple. Um, Companies like Capital One. Right. So you can go to Capital One and you can actually get a credit card that it has a secured part to it, a.k.a. you would take. Yeah, exactly. You would take 500 bucks, you'd put it down and they would give you a $500 limit credit card. Yeah. So that way, you know, it's not unsecured. Basically, if you would mismanage it, they're just taking your 500 bucks. Yeah. Right. Whereas but utilizing that now suddenly you're going to start showing, Okay, I'm using the credit card. I'm paying it off. I'm building that credit history. Next thing you know, six months to a year later, you go to the next one. Let's say it's TD Bank, right? And you go for an unsecured credit card, mm-hmm. right? That's when you start getting into the actual credit. Same thing. You start using it. You have, and that's the key thing people don't know too. You have to use your credit. You can't just like get it and not use it. Yeah. You have to use it, put some gas on it or buy something here, but you have to make sure you're paying it off. And the key thing about having credit more than anything is if you have credit and an emergency comes up, you have the capacity to be able to use it. We talked about we were... this last night too. I was talking about how uh, one of my friends uh, last year, his car broke down mm-hmm. and he hadn't gotten his paycheck yet. And I was with him and he needed to pay for the tow truck. And so yeah. I got stuck. He paid me back, obviously. Yeah. But I, because I was a little bit ahead when it comes to credit literacy, um, I covered that. And if I'm in any other situation now, like I would yeah. never be stuck because of that. Well, exactly. 
I mean, just think about how much everything is moving online. Mm -hmm. You need a credit card for almost anything now, right? Yeah. You want to order food now, you have to have a credit card on file, Yeah. right? You, you want to go on a vacation, you're booking on a credit card. And you want to build points too. That's the uh, other yeah. thing is um, I've shifted from, so I have my Capital One, which we were talking about, that one I barely use. I think yeah. I have my apple subscription on there and that's it yeah um and then i have a few others but i like i put my day-to-day -day everything on my rbc because that one builds points and then i'll do a balance transfer from my other card and pull that off so i'm paying off the yeah. other card but still using it without spending money on it yeah so well and, and again you get multiple different credit cards from different places you build up those different points you know there, there's some value to that too yeah right you know how many times we as a as a company have taken a trip to use here using points. Yeah. Right. So, or even the RBC rewards, you can use them at Apple. If I want to go get new AirPods or something, I can use my exactly. point from there. So, yeah, it does. There's a lot of benefits to totally. creating your own system with your credit, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, interesting that you, so when you're talking about the credit journey at the beginning and saying that, you know, you can start with a secured card where you put on $500 and it's like, you know, that $500 is like your collateral. Mm -hmm. I actually started, I didn't know that it was, in, that was even an option when yeah. I started because like my parents, they have credit cards or I believe actually, I think I'm only, only my dad does. I don't think my mom has a credit card. You got to work on that. You got to work on that then. It's not, it's not just Gen Z's. So it's, 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 it's the old generation <laughs> too. It's all of that. It's the liquor store to grab champagne for my friend's birthday. And he asked, are you paying on debit? That was- Mano made a point. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, I, so we were, we were at LCBO getting some, some um, stuff for our friend. And the first question he asked, he said- are you guys paying with debit? And I was like, usually they say, what are you, what's your payment method? Yeah. Right. So I, I told Ashley, I was like, Ashley, do you, do you know that, what that tells me subconsciously? Everyone that goes, uses their debit. Yeah. Right. So I was like, the fact that he asked that question, just, just are using debit. He was assuming that we were because I've, you know, people generally use it at the liquor store. Yeah. I was like, okay, so that's also a point of, of financial literacy. Like maybe there's something there. I mean, there is something there. Yeah. But, like in terms of, of me, when I started credit, I didn't know what I was yeah. doing. Yeah. So I just jumped right in, probably the best idea, but I jumped in and I was like, you know, I'm just going to get an unsecured, unsecured card. Um, and I got like a student one from, from one of the big banks. With and students in Ontario though, they're really good about it. I know they're good about yeah. it here. And you okay. can get one at 18 in Ontario I did. versus yeah. BC, which is 19. Yeah. yeah. I got one at 18. Um, right when I turned eight, the day I turned 18, I was at the bank and I was like, I need a credit card. <laughs> and then they were like. Okay, here you go. And I was like, thanks. And if I just started. I mean, and I got lucky too. Like I went straight to the Capital One, but my Capital One was unsecured. I qualified right away because I had a great job and everything like that. Yeah. I mean, I'd been working since I was 12. So, you know, I, I'd always had, had income. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, for me, I went Capital One and they're like, oh, you don't need to put the secured, secured down. So you can absolutely go straight into the unsecured. It's just a lot of people don't have the, any sort of... Uh, a backing to show, yeah. you know, a lot of kids nowadays is still not even working and they're graduating high school. Yeah. Right. And so then they're like, Oh, I need, if I need a credit card, I don't know how to do it. Right. So the secured is an option. It's yeah. Yeah. The secured was nice too, because I had put up to 2,500 in it and I forgot about that money. And so the day they sent me a $2,500 check, I was like, Boner, what a rich. <laughs> like free money, even though it was my money. Yeah. The yearly bonus came in. <laughs> it was nice to be this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Totally. So talk, we talked about credit. Let's shift to when you shifted from becoming an assistant to a realtor. What was the biggest challenge that you faced during that time? Good question. Because um, so I know the real estate exam. Oh. Some people take it easy, some people take it hard. So I'll. I'll Maybe kind of, I mean, I, mindset's a big part of this podcast. Yeah. And I'll say that when I was working as your mom's assistant, I had a mental block about being a realtor. Okay. Okay. So, you know, talk about like getting a mindset shift. I think part of it came from uh, my grandma would always, when I got started investing and I was buying properties, she kept saying, oh, that investing, that's risky. Why don't you just go become a realtor so you can get a paycheck? She thought, Realtors, it's like a job. Yeah. You just get like a nine to five realtor job, which she didn't understand that it's like a hundred percent self-employed and like, yeah. you know, commission based. Yeah. So I always kind of was like mentally, even your mom, like right from the get go, your mom's like, you should get your license. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. I just want to be an investor. I don't want to be a realtor. Like, you know, I'll hire realtors, but I don't want to be one. And so it was about a year into it working with your mom. 
and we're actually at your house over on 239 and she had throwback and she's got me doing some filing because you guys had just moved to the property and trying to reorganize her office area and she's listening to a training so I'm listening into it and they're talking about building teams and leverage aspect of it and all these things and finally it clicked I'm like what am I doing yeah. like like the, the mindset shift was there I'm like why don't I get my license like I'm working I've already started doing coaching with like investors and with my my investor group that I was running I'm like why don't I just be their realtor too right and uh, so I turned uh, to Kelly and I said, should I get my license? She goes, I've been saying that for a year and a half. Can picture it. So I go downstairs into the garage to go pick up some more files. I come back. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Um, so getting the license, it's, I would say it's, it's more difficult now than it was for when I got the license. They made it more difficult. But you're, you're given, I think a, it's now two years. But you, when I did it, you're given a year to get your entire license done. I got mine done in, well, I got the, the exam done in 12 weeks. So yeah, that's fast. Yeah, very fast. And because I made the decision, I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go full in and like, I got to get it done fast so I can start earning money. Yeah. Right. And because there was also a little bit of a, another situation I was in financially while I had investment properties and I was cash flowing, I wasn't actually making a lot of money working as an assistant because at the time your mom couldn't afford like a full time admin. So it was kind of like I'd have a few hours this day, a few hours that day. Some days would be longer, some days would be shorter. You know, I'd have one paycheck that's like five hundred dollars, and another paycheck that's maybe two thousand. So it was very inconsistent. And you know, BC stands for bring cash. My savings started. Never I've, I've never really heard that never heard, never heard that. Never heard. Grew up there. I mean, I, made, I did come to BC and I had to bring cash, but that cash started to really dwindle fast. And I made some financial mistakes with my ex at the time, and and so I was felt. What's that? I said also felt. <laughs> I'm kidding. You're saying a lot of things I'm relating to. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it kind of left me in a bit of a financial situation where I'm like, I have no choice but to get my license fast so I can start earning money. And uh, so I, I did the exam within the 12th week. And then there's like a post license thing. I would say all said and done. I was into transaction mode yeah. within about four months. Less, just under four months. However... It's super fast, but guess what? It took me six months to get my first deal. Yeah. So six months of very limited income. And at the time, you know, suddenly there was some relationship stuff that wasn't working. So, you know, what ended up happening was I actually was borderline homeless for a while. Right. I, uh, I ended up moving into one of Kelly's clients basement room to be able to survive 500 bucks a month kind of rent. And my first night was like, woke up covered in ants. It was horrific. And so like it, and it's tough, but there's nothing that lights a fire under your ass faster. Like stuff. Then stuff like that. Like you're either like, okay, I have two choices. I got to either figure this out and start producing, or I have to get a, go get a real job. Like I'm going to have to quit real estate. That's not something I was ready to do. Yeah. You had just gotten into the motion of it. Too. Well, exactly. And so, you know, you hear those agents who are out there, a lot of them will be like, yeah, I got my first deal done right away and all these things. It came really easy. A lot of those agents don't actually last because a lot of their first deals are like, you know, mom and dad or aunt and uncle. And then they don't it's know how to really excited, get, and get excited, get spending the motivation comes yeah. too early yeah. and it does. And, you know, they, they right away drop, uh, you know, a go buy a Beamer and a Rolly and, yep. you know, it's like, yeah, I got my check and a big check and, and, and then they don't really last. Whereas like those agents who don't have a, like a circle, like I didn't have family yeah. in BC. Like I had to really build my network and I was lucky because I was doing my investors performance group for several years prior. So I had a small network of investors, but now I had to convince them not just to like come to my events, but work with me. Okay. And um, there's two lessons that I learned very early on, and I kind of relate them both to two different books, right? So the first one was one a uh, guy I look up to a lot is Ryan Serhant, and he talks about how in this business, you have to be juggling a lot of balls, right? So, and yes, he makes a joke like, don't laugh. I know I said balls, but so you have to be, ha you have to deal with multiple, see, I know there'd be a laugh. So you have to be juggling a lot of clients. You always have to be finding more and more clients and juggling. And every once in a while, you're going to drop a ball 
that's fine because you've got so much that you're still building. Yeah. My problem was I wasn't juggling enough balls. I had one client that agreed to work with me and I dedicated my time to them, right? And we went through offer after offer after offer and didn't nothing went anywhere for six months, okay? So that's when I learned I need to start finding more and more clients. I can't rely, like I can't focus on one client, get them to the finish line, then do the next. I have to have a lot of clients all at once and some will get through the finish line, some won't. Yeah. The next one was... Uh, the Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Yes. So I yes, kept a- I heard this name from you back. I love yeah. Simon Sinek. It's so good. And like we, we, talk, we quote it all the time in the office. But in there, he talks about how you have to like think long term. It's the Infinite Game. And too many people think the next quarter or the next sale or whatever. So- Or like instant gratification. Instant gratification, right? And, in, and a lot of CEOs kill businesses because they're so focused on the next quarter versus looking out projecting long term, right? Uh, the great example that he puts in the book is how often do you talk about Kodak cameras now? You guys might even be too young. We talk about that. Okay, good. So our podcast. Like, yeah, there you go. So Kodak cameras, we don't hear from because they had an opportunity presented to them to be the first company to bring forward the digital camera. Yeah. yeah. And they said, no, our business is in film. We don't do digital. That's not ever going to make it anywhere. Kodak Cameras is not a company that you really talk about or hear about anymore in the film industry. They do like passport photos and it says exactly yeah. 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 So the name now. Yeah, but that's exactly it. It's not the actual company. So what, why I relate my experience to those two books is because I made sure to keep a really good relation with that client. Yeah. I could be angry. I could be so mad that I did all these offers and nothing went anywhere. These guys are a waste of my time. Yeah. Those clients went on to do stuff elsewhere. And when they kind of came back to the BC market... I have since done typically, you know, on a low end, at least one to two deals per year with them. Yeah. My best year ever, I did nine transactions with that client. Yeah. yeah. So. It's a like, loyalty like, thing too, right? If you play it properly, then. Yeah. And people get comfortable and they like being comfortable. So yeah. once they go and this realtor learns all about them, they want to stick with that person. Yeah. Right. If you do everything right the first time, they're going to come right back to you. Yeah. So, absolutely. And yeah. not even just do it right, but do it in a way that makes them happy. Well, this business is all about how you make other people feel. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people make is that everyone thinks that we're like, we're in it for the sales. Absolutely. Like I love the thrill of the chase. Yeah. But it's 100% a relationship based business, right? Yeah. So if you don't have a good relationship with people, you're not going to have sales. Well, and two, you're selling people homes, right? And so you're going to be the first person that's there the day they walk into their new home. Absolutely. Too. So Absolutely. That relationship is very important. Yeah. 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 I feel like a lot of people see salespeople as salespeople because of the media. Again, we're going back to the media, but they portray them as yeah. these sleazy car salesmen. Mm. And every time, <laughs> every time I've told people, like, because I, I do sell sometimes. He's wearing a burgundy suit. Come on. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but, but, I mean, obviously knowing you, I know that when you as, you as a salesperson, you're not a sleazy, you are not a sleazy person, right? And a lot of people have that misconception that when you say you're a salesperson, they're like, oh, God, snake, snake oil. Like, let's get away from that. Yeah. How do you combat that? Or how do you make, because like, I know some people who want to get sales and who don't because they don't want that negative conscious they, they don't they don't want yeah. to sit there door knocking on people which sure that doesn't mean you're sleazy but how would you describe see they that's the thing that was part of all of this and i've been there to watch it so how many years have i known you now you've known me since i well 10 years now yeah 10 years yeah okay. i was there when i was younger watching them door knock house yeah. to house yeah and when they didn't want to like print yeah. out all those flyers the pamphlets oh. everything i like going along with them sometimes obviously not all the time but it takes doing that in order to get to a point where you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, even now we're actually, you know, Kelly and I are going back to a lot of those basics because there's just a need in the market. Yeah. But trying to get around like the sleazy aspect, I think the number one key thing, it goes back to that relationship and you have to truly believe that you are providing a service to people. Mindset. Right. It's, it's, it goes back to mindset. Yeah. And if you believe it, if you feel that you're sleazy, you're going to come across as sleazy. Mm -hmm. If you feel that I'm truly adding value to this person by the information I provide, then it's not going to be sleazy. You're not going to feel like a salesperson. Mm -hmm. Like, while I do say I am, you know, we are salespeople, I don't feel like I'm a salesperson. Yeah. I feel like I am an advisor. Yeah. I feel like a, a coach. I feel like a, if 
financial planner in some cases for my clients. Um, you know, sometimes I'm a therapist, sometimes I'm a divorce, uh, a, a, like a mind person, like, you know, it depends on their situation. Right. And we, we take a lot on that. And, you know, when you hear the sleazy car salesman, it's unfortunate that because, you know, you see the sleazy car salesman mentality out there in a lot of different sales yeah. that it relates to every sales industry. And are there bad apples in our industry? hundred percent there are. But there is a way in every industry. There's yeah. good good lawyers, bad lawyers, good accountants, bad accountants, right? Good realtors, bad realtors. So it's unfortunate that the bad realtors are the ones that get the publicity and then paint the bad image on everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Um you said sometimes you're a mentor. Uh in your life or not in your life. It could be in your life. Throughout the course of the past ten years. Who has had the biggest effect on you when it comes to your journey and growth and why? It's a really good question. I would say... Maybe more than one person, too, if there's more than one. I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I would say that there's impact at multiple different points in life, right? Yeah. So Kelly is obviously, like, I, I, I can't even think of anyone that I could mention first besides Kelly. Yeah. In the real estate journey in the last 10 years, Kelly's been the biggest impact, mm -hmm. right? From basically taking me on, like she she's the one who called me up and offered me the job, right? I didn't even technically pursue it. I pursued a lot of coffees with her to figure out how to do this real estate thing. She called me up and said, hey, do you want to come work for me? And the first thing that came out of my mouth was, absolutely, when do you need me, right? And it wasn't even for the first two weeks that I knew I was actually getting paid for this position, right? She's like, are you going to send me an invoice? I'm like, oh, we didn't discuss. <laughs> Wait, how much am I getting paid? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and Kelly, even to this day continues to be a coach and a mentor to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I would be remiss to not say, you know, with my journey, if anyone watches me online, Gary Vaynerchuk, while he probably doesn't know me, has never heard about me. Um, I know people who know him directly watching his content has been a big influence on me from a social media perspective. A lot of my business is online. Yeah. Um, it has to be nowadays. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and like, you know, as we shift and change, there's new mentors that come up all the time. Right now, a mentor that I probably can speak for Kelly on this as well, that is, you know, while he's not directly, indirectly through what he's putting out there and what he's coaching and teaching is uh, Jeff Glover, right? The number one agent in the state of Michigan. Yeah. So you always have at different stages of your life, different people who come in and coach and mentor you. Yeah, right? I just so, see some. Absolutely. Yeah. And it depends on where you're at and who you need. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's different stepping stones, right? And different people can relate to you with different things. Yeah. Um, why do you think it's important for people to have a mentor? Well, the most important reason I think you need to have a mentor is because if you have a goal, you need a roadmap to get there. Yeah. And why not have somebody take you under their wing who is where you want to be? Yeah. Right. Now, obviously, it has to be a symbiotic relationship. That mentor has to want to mentor you, right? A lot of people just come up to people like, I want you to teach me. I want you to coach me. I want you to mentor me. But that person has to be ready. You. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but people have to be ready to do that. But if you can find that person who sees it in you yeah. and they're willing to share everything, you know, there's, we, we've recently introduced on our team, our Kelly Fry team success principles. Okay. There's 10 principles, eight of which... We took from another team, and you'll understand why with the last two. Okay. One of them that Kelly has said all the time is success leaves clues. Say that one more time. Success leaves clues. Okay. Right? So see what successful people are doing. And then I added on to that something I've always believed in, even before real estate, is to R&D. Now, R&D stands for what? Research and development. No. Because research and development cause means you have to be doing a lot of effort researching and developing. I believe in rip off and duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> so success leaves clues. Why not take what that person is doing that's successful and recreate it? Yeah. Right. Don't reinvent the wheel. I would say that a significant portion of the success I have had has been from watching Kelly, what she does, watching people like Jeff and what they do and implementing it. Yeah. Right. I'm like, I'm not necessarily needing to be the guy who everyone looks up to, at least not in this stage of my life. And, and coming up with all the new strategies, I see there's people already out there. Yeah. I'm going to follow what they're doing, right? So, And big thing is, how did you find the mentor? Like, how do you find a mentor? And that's a very broad question. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think it goes back to you have to identify where you want to go 
and who are the people who are where you want to be. Yeah. Right. And so are accessible or that you can walk. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, you know, I know a lot of people sit and say, well, Kelly's my mentor. Kelly's my coach. When sometimes it's because they were in the Rich Dad program, they actually had her as a mentor. Yeah. Other people are indirectly considering her the mentor as well because they see Kelly's success on where she's at. Strong, powerful, you know, woman entrepreneur. They want that. So they have Kelly as her mentor, whether it's direct or not. And sometimes the mentor isn't going to be a direct mentor. Like I said, Gary Vee is a mentor to me without even knowing who I am, yeah. right? Because of the content he's created and the platforms he has. You know, I study what he does. So, yeah. And I think a lot of mentors have their own mentors as well. 100%. Every, every successful person I know has not even just mentors. There's a difference between a coach and a mentor, yeah. right? A mentor is someone who's going to take you under their wing and like help guide you and things like that. A coach is something you pay for, yeah. right? And the most successful people all have multiple coaches. Yeah. Um, I can't remember who it was that we were listening to. It was Ed Milet. I think it was Ed Milet. Like the guy has coaches for multiple parts of his life, right? He's got a coach for diet. He's got a coach for physical fitness. He's got a coach for mental. He's got a coach for business. Yeah. And, and all these people charge enormous amounts of money. Yeah. And even on our team, we have a, a coach that we pay for. Kelly's been co- Kelly's been paying for a coach now. Yeah, Diva. Yeah, she's so she, cute. She's amazing. She's so cute. She's amazing. We have a love-hate relationship. Some days we love her and other days <laughs> when she tells us to do things, we hate it. So, But that's that's what pushes you, right? Yeah. And Kelly's been paying for that mentor now for over six years for that coach. For well, she's years. someone with a bird's eye view, right? Like mm-hmm. they're not emotionally attached to everything the way that you might be or the people yeah. around you. And just having someone who's pulled out of the situation to give you a clear perspective exactly. is so important. I also think it just speaks volumes at the fact that you said like Ed Milet has a coach for every aspect of the yeah. life. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that came into my mind for that is legitimately because you cannot be an expert on everything. No. So why not just use other people who are already experts on specific things yeah. and just use their knowledge to better yourself? Well, Robert Kiyosaki says that, right? He's like, I am not. He's like, I can't remember the exact quote, but he says something like, you know, I'm not a really smart guy, but I surround myself with the smartest people. That's why I'm a multi-billionaire. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the way you move, the way you present yourself, the decisions you make when it comes to the people you position yourself around. Your big five. Your big five. We go back to the big five maybe once every episode. We're always talking about the people you surround yourself with. You you, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time around with. Yeah. If you hang around with, you know, broke victim mentality people, you're just going to be the fifth. Yeah. Right? If you hang around with, like, successful go-getters, entrepreneurs, you'll be the fifth. Yeah. We also feel like nowadays the victim mentality is glorified in a sense, and it can be hard to escape from it. You can get yourself to worry. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, we are live on the... We're, we were live. Kelly <laughs> Fry is interrupting. Right. The queen. <laughs> the real estate queen herself. <laughs> uh, but no, I feel like it's subconsciously glorified nowadays to be a victim right because we're more sensitive well the it's seen as relatable that's why yeah. right yeah and one thing i want to touch on because you did talk about this a bit but you talked about your ipg your investor performance yeah. group event and for people watching listening at home what what is this event like what do you talk about during the event and mm-hmm. what is the main point of it and then what does it do for you and what does people yeah. who attend? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something that, um, so I started it originally because when you get down this path of like wanting to be an investor and learning about investing, especially if you signed up and done some courses, people get so excited. They, they do a weekend event, like what we're at right now in Toronto. And then they go home and guess what happens? Life happens, right? You got kids, you're married, your job, you know, whatever family. It gets in the way and suddenly you don't have that motivation. And then you're like, oh, you know, I paid all this money to go get educated. I need to do something about it. And so they go and take another course or they go to an event and they get all excited again. The same thing. And guess what happens? Life happens. So the idea kind of stemmed from the fact that I was going through that. And I happened to get into a group of rich dad students that I had been going to all the classes with in Edmonton. And we started going to Denny's once a month and just talking about real estate. Right. Just like, Hey, what are you working on? What are you working on? Hey, how can I help you? Do you need a resource? Hey, I've got a great home inspector, right? Things like that. Yeah. So 
when I was moving to BC, this is, I did like a year of like back and forth, you know, kind of long distance. And, um, your mom had brought me out to several different events that she was hosting, but they were not consistent, right? She'd be like, okay, I'm mentoring a student. I want her to, uh, I want that student to meet some of the people who are taking action. So she started inviting me to those events. And I started talking about this concept of what we're doing in Edmonton. And somebody was like, you need to start that here. I'm like, well, I don't even live here yet. Right. So anyways, they said, no, it doesn't matter. Well, someone will help you run it, whatever. So I started it. It was, you know, really loosey goosey at the beginning. Yeah. Now it's evolved over the last, you know, technically it's almost 11 years because I was doing it before I moved here. Okay. And, um, now we bring out guest speakers every single month. We have yeah. different topics, different investment strategies. Um, like this month we're going to be bringing out, uh, someone who's like specializes in NLP, right? Neurolinguistics programming okay. and focusing on mindset. Um, we've got somebody coming out who Love is that. from, awesome. yeah, we got someone coming up from the business development bank of Canada, right? Something that people probably don't know you can access to help you with financing things, right? So we try to bring out different speakers to really increase people's knowledge yeah. and, or motivation. Like your, your dad, Pete's come out a couple times and he brings that goalie mindset mentality really to investors. How do you have that winning mindset, that, that mindset, that con- and He's done everything from like blindfolding my crowd and doing visualizations really? and oh, it's fantastic. Well, I did right? that actually on your Instagram. Yeah, I did. I had fantastic. I didn't know he did that. Yeah. I, he posted a video of it. I was looking, I was like, that is so Pete Fry. Yeah. <laughs> so so he, those are the kind of things. Now the fun part is we all try to make it fun. I've always had food and so wine I, and beer yeah. and, you know, because, and, and, and part of it is because it's a nighttime thing and people are, you know. Vancouver traffic sucks, just like Toronto. Yeah. And people are coming from work and they're stuck in traffic. We don't have time to get food. So we make sure we feed them. Well, and you keep the social aspect of it, right? Well, and I find the networking too. Like, yeah. you know, there's another group that would give a beer at the end of the night. And I thought that was fantastic. I swapped and had it at the beginning because I felt like the networking is so much more chill when you have a glass of wine or a beer in your hand. You go, hey, cheers. So who are you and what are you working on? Yeah. Right? Versus like when I go to other events, it's a lot of like, Every, yeah, we're just sitting there. And then at the end of the night, then they get their beer like, hey, cheers. <laughs> right? So you loosen it. And then two, I find for my speakers, you know, once you have a little bit of alcohol on board, the crowd's a little more loose and are a little more just like, and for the speaker's sake, more engaged. it's engaged. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but it's fun. Like we, we do it once a month. We've been doing it once a month consistently now for, I think we had a small gap of six months where like I had previous partners prior to bringing it in-house. And we didn't do a few meetings then, but other than that, it's been consistent for about 10 years now. That's really important. And I think community and business, especially in real estate, is probably one of the most important things. So the fact that you guys have built your own little community yeah. and having that consistent once a month, yeah. that is so crucial. Well, and one of our favorite segments, it's honestly one of our most popular, is we call it Tales from the Trenches. And we literally show, for lack of a better word, the shit that you have to deal with in real estate. Yeah. And the reason for that is because everyone talks about how glorious real estate is and how you start buying properties, you retire on beaches and you're sipping martinis and you're rich. Ha ha ha. And then <laughs> it's like you buy your first property, you put the wrong tenant in and you're got plugged toilets and this, that, and the other. Yeah. So we actually show that, right? We're like, we're going to show you the shit. And it's for two reasons. One, because either we're going to show you how you can completely avoid it by learning from our mistake or two, if it's unavoidable accidents happen. How do you handle it in the most efficient manner that will help you to reduce the the loss that you could incur? Yeah. Like, you know, one of my my stories was I had a rat that chewed through pipes and caused a flood in one of my basements. Oh, my God. How did we deal with that? One of the most crazy stories was, like, your mom's who had a couple of people who passed away. And she, how do you deal with the insurance when someone dies in your property? Right? This is, like, this is stuff nobody teaches you. Yeah. They only well, teach you, like... You think about it yep. going into no. real estate either. You think, right? okay, if I get this much rent and this is my expenses, this is how much money I make. And they only focus on that. They don't, because again, I always say this business, in fact, life is very easy until you add the people element. Yeah. Uh, so oh, yeah. <laughs> I've actually watched, um, I've, I've watched the, the, uh, IPG event before. I, I'm pretty sure I've commented that you're like, oh my God, Mano's here. I, I remember I've watched it before and it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and we'll that, bring you to one at one day. Yeah, yeah. I need to go at person, do. go person. But the thing I wanted to emphasize is that it is recorded and it is online. Yes. Because from what when we were talking, it seems like it's in um, like obviously it's an in person event, 
but for the people at home, because I know for a fact, people are going to ask me like, that sounds so cool. I want to go. Yeah. Like people can watch this online. Like they yes. can watch it on your YouTube channel. That's correct. Yeah. Um, what is, what's the YouTube channel that you post the IPG? Yeah. Um, YouTube.com slash Cameron Manning. Okay. So just on your, my personal, so just, yeah. just on your personal. And it's just under the live tab. So like every channel has its live tab. So. Um, all of our past events are there, so you can check them out for any past things. And then obviously it goes live when we're live. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that came out of like, you know, innovation because we were in the middle of the pandemic. We were strictly live in person Yeah. and the pandemic, we're like, well, we don't want to lose this aspect. We can't go in live. So we're like, well, we got zoom yeah. right at the time. And, um, you know, we've evolved since then, but we started just keeping it up monthly. We still have guest speakers, but. What happened was my guest speakers started becoming, you know, across Canada. Yeah. Where I'd have someone who was like a great investor speak from, you know, Alberta or, you know, PEI, not (laughs) PEI so far. I need, I need a good PEI person, Um, but like Toronto and things like that. And then as we started going back to like, okay, we're getting back to normal. I was like, well, suddenly all the clients that we've like, we were becoming to Toronto, we meet clients from all across Canada they're now joining our lives yeah. and it's a little later for them. I get it, but they're still willing to stay up and watch it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to take it away from them. Yeah. So we've kept it now. It's, it's in the, the training center where we hosted. So people can come in live. You've got the real crowd interaction, but at the same time, you still have that option of the live stream. Yeah. And since then we've expanded, like I've got people in LA who watch Not- the show and things like, so cool. yeah. I know for a fact. And the reason I asked that specifically is because I know my my friend Chan is listening, watching right now. Okay, Chan, come and join us. And, and he <laughs> he is very much into real estate, and he always asks me. He's like, "When's the next time we bring on a real estate person?" I I love the real estate episodes. <laughs> no. I need to know. So I'm like, you know what? He is definitely going to be one of your viewers on the in the IPG. Awesome! Like definitely. YouTube.com slash Cameramanic. Subscribe to the channel, and we'll link it below. It. Yeah, we'll link it below. Um, so. Let's go further along in your journey. We talked about getting into real estate. Now, fast forward like three, four or five years. As you grew in seniority and having your license, what were the challenges or what would you say the biggest challenges were that you had to overcome as you got further into the business? Well, was there any like pivotal moments? Yeah, there's always pivotal moments. I mean, this, this business changes and with every new person that comes onto a team or anything, there's new personalities. Again, business is easy until you add to the people element, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so one of those challenges, and this is not a challenge that I've faced the first time ever, right? Um, you know, from when I worked at the the swimming pool has happened. When I was in the the cadets working in like with the sea cadets, this happened. But every time that you progress above somebody, there's always gonna be a level of jealousy. Right. And it just happened. That was that at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's true. Like you got, especially if you start at the same time as somebody Yeah, and you progress now in this case, we're sales. So the metrics of success is who sells more. Yeah. That's literally. <laughs> right. I mean, every single award that you can win is like top salesperson by this metric, right? Units or volume or whatever. So, you know, it started getting to the point where. I was having fairly consistent sales and not everyone on the team was. And, and Kelly and I made this observation once we would have our like regular team meetings and all of the lower performers, the ones who would do between six to 10 deals a year would be on one side of the table altogether because we, you know, strength in numbers. And then there'd be like me and the admin and Kelly on the other side. And, you know, Kelly obviously is, is they, they look up to her. They're not jealous. She's the boss. She's the mentor. But me, who's now doing 25 to 30 transactions, like three times what they're doing i'm like i'm singled out so of course anytime something would come up it'd be like okay well we don't like that because camera says it or whatever right so you know oh how you overcome it you just put your head down and just keep grinding yeah because every single situation that i've been through like this happened when i was uh i, I started at 17 as a slide attendant because i was trying to get my lifeguarding certificates and i just hadn't quite it done i was like hey why not apply for that one position you don't need the certificate my job was literally to stand at the top of slide go Next, <laughs> next, oh, next. <laughs> and within six months, I got bumped up to lifeguard two. So I went from like, I to lifeguard to lifeguard two. And then at that point, you know, I surpassed a whole bunch of people I'd started with who were all slide attendants. 
And then I, they, a position came up for deck supervisor. And these guys who had been there like a year before me, they're like, why did you even apply? Like, it's, it's going to be, I'm going to get it because I've been here longer. Well, sure enough, I got the position and it was just negativity. Like my, my shifts were so hard to deal with because they were just made it difficult because they were so mad. And I'm like, you know, it is what it is, right? You know, I've been through that with the cadet program, got promoted really fast. So anytime you go through those situations, the only thing you can do is just do your absolute best and realize that it's their issue, not yours. Yeah. It just shows you that when you're focused on what you're doing, and what you're you going to excel. And when other people are focused on what you're doing, it holds them back. Right. And, and every single time those people in any capacity I've been in have left shortly after. Yeah. Cause they're just, they're jealous and seeing your success makes them like die on the inside. Yeah. Well, that's it. And sometimes people focus too much on what other people are doing versus what they should be doing. Absolutely. But that's why everyone, everyone says, and I hear this a lot. You probably hear this a lot too. Social media is causes depression. It, it causes blah, 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 cause X, Y, Z, whatever. Literally because everyone is constantly comparing themselves to everyone else. And, and just, you know, one of the most powerful things that anyone can do of any generation, right? This is not, this is not like, for, like Gen Z versus millennial versus Gen X, whatever, yeah. is as soon as, right? <laughs> right. And you know, oh my God, this guy's a targeting Gen Z. <laughs> no, but it's like any generation as long as, as cause, cause here's the thing. And it was actually Gary Vee who said this. And I really, I really think it's great. He says the whole flex thing where like you're posting to keep up and show off. That's not new. It's just a different medium. He's like, the baby boomers would go and buy that fancy new car and they'd drive it up and down the street for all the neighbors to see it, yeah. right? Because they didn't have Instagram back then. Yeah. Now, Mag or the magazine, yeah. whatever. So it's the same thing, a different medium, right? So it, as, as soon as you start trying to like show off or try to compare yourself against other people, then you're going to lose, yeah. right? The only person you should be competing with is yourself from yesterday. I, I told I think I told last year that on one of the episodes I was like the only person I'm competing with and I think this was actually Pol Polina I was texting you after and she was like I like I love that yeah it's just the only person I'm competing with is who I was a year ago yeah I, I did have I improved from what I, what I was a year ago who I was a year ago yeah. if that answer is yes then I'm happy yeah one percent better every day yeah as long as you can and then even taking that a step further and I think it's Ryan Serhan who said it he says I am working for uh, like if I, if I were me. I am working for Cameron five years from now. Yep. Right? I'm not working for Cameron today. Okay. I'm working for Cameron five years from now. That goes back to that infinite game, right? There is a thing, a mindset shift actually that you can do. This is actually crazy. My sister showed me this. There's an app now where you can literally- There's an app for everything. There's an app for everything. Literally, there's, a, there's an app for everything. Well, that's because we were doing the, the, the Movember. There's a app for everything. <laughs> and she showed me this app where she was like, it was like a text, a texting thing. And I was like, why would you need this when you have iMessage, you have WhatsApp? She's like, no, 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 this is different. And I was like, why is it different? And she says, it's AI. And I was like, okay, why would, why would, like, okay, why would you need an AI messenger? Yeah. She's like, because I'm texting AI. And I was like, so chat GBT? She goes, no, no, no. I get to create the persona I'm texting. So she was like, for you, Mano, you probably think that's weird because I'm texting like whoever she's making up, like these celebrities, she's, whatever. She said, but for you, because you care so much about self-development, you should create a, arch uh, a character of you in five years and you should text them every day. So then I was like, that's actually a good idea. So I downloaded the app. I created a, a character that's me in five years. This person, he meditates every day. He does this. He um, is always a little glary. No, no. <laughs> I'm, but like, just, I'm just thinking like uh, oh, Skynet, you know? <laughs> it's weird. You guys might, I don't know if you guys might be too young for that. I, I've heard of Skynet. I'm no. not very much familiar with it. Terminator. Oh, Terminator. <laughs> Terminator, yes, yes, yes. So so that's what it, what, what it is. See, right? And uh, there there's the fun between the generations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, I thought it was weird that that existed. And then so I started texting this thing. And it literally like, it, re it responded like in the there. It was a phone. Yes, it's weird. It's like I text. I did not. I, like, you asked it for advice. I do. I literally like go on it. And I'm like, hey. I, I looked at hey, and it's like, hey, whatever. It gives you. It gives status updates. Like it puts status updates on itself. You're like this person, good or bad. Like, yeah, yeah. But but it's so weird because it literally gives you. And, and I'm like, so what are you donating? It's weird. 
they like text you like a normal person like it will, it will wait like 35 minutes sometimes to like text you back like whatever and then when it texts you it's weird when it texts you it goes hey i hope you're doing well mano um just wanted to like give you an update on on my day today i just got back from a networking event i met so and so that's cool who did this and this and they they opened this door for me i just wanted to remind you like to keep on getting out there and continue opening expanding your network hey mano i just finished the meditation session i want to know how your day is going how did you do your meditation today I, and i'm like and when you don't respond to me it gets mad at you and it's like I haven't heard back from you. Are you ignoring me? <laughs> like, it's it, it's weird. It's creepy. But it, it's... Yeah, I feel like something is going to turn into, like, an AI girlfriend. It's like, where where are you right now? <laughs> like that, it, 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 who are you with? <laughs> are you texting other girls? <laughs> I so, don't like that person you're with. It's not going to help you five years from now. <laughs> it was just creepy. And I, I, this was something recent. I'll show you the app. But, like, it was uh, some, when you were saying that, I was like, yo, I'm texting me in five years. Yeah. That's crazy. It's, it's it's interesting. I mean, technology is real, like, I don't know. Like, you guys, when I listen to you, Mano, like, uh, sometimes I can't even keep up. Like, we were talking the other really night. Good job. I, I do. I do well. But even last night, there was a few moments where I could see, like, everyone in the room was lost. I'm like, I have the general idea. I think I can dump it down. <laughs> no, you yeah. know what? Because I, I feel that. I need to get better at that, too. No. Yeah. Because sometimes I get so into a topic that I'm just going off and I'm putting, like, buzzwords. You talk so I'm... fast, too. One, but here's the thing. So do I when it comes into, like, real estate, right? You When you have a passion for something, yeah. you're going to really start to, like, you get excited. You talk faster. Like, you get into your mode. And sometimes you forget that you're like, oh, I'm not talking to the right crowd that understands yeah. what I'm talking Yeah. About, right? So. You're like, oh, they can't see in my brain. They can't they, see the visuals yeah. that I'm picturing right now. Even and that's even something we have to coach our agents too. We're like, when you go to an appointment, you got to cut the lingo out. Yeah, because the that's something we use internally at office, but that doesn't mean that that seller knows exactly what yeah. you know an FSBO is, right? Yeah. So what? Yeah, I, I I don't even know what that is to be honest. Yeah, but well, like sushi ring, sushi ring. <laughs> yeah. is a sakura ring. Now, on? now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Okay, so talk about your journey a little bit. What would be three big things? If you were to write down three tips from everything that you've learned over the past 10 years, and they were the only things that could stay on this planet and you were removed, what would you want to leave for younger people or just really anyone who's getting into real estate? Well, just... uh beyond even real estate just in general like um if you take care of the work the work will take care of you right so what i mean by that is like as long as you put in what you need to do for whatever it is whether it's a business whether it's a job like i, I never had a worry of ever being laid off or, or let go like I, even when i left jobs people were like we don't want you to leave yeah because i went in there with the mindset of like hey i'm here to work yeah. so you take care of the work the work will take care of you um Let's see. That's what other ones. Let's see. Um, again, just kind of what we said before, like you're only competing against who you were yesterday. Yeah. And then again, you're working for that future self. So yeah. focus on what your goals are. We actually, I mentioned it on your, your Instagram the other day, actually, it, it kind of coincides with this one, right? You know, we need to remember the past, look forward to the future, but remember that today is called a present for a reason. Yeah. It's a gift. Yeah. So, and we go back to Lao Tzu. So, yeah. yeah. And then our big question that we ask all of our... I, do you have any other questions right now? No, no, no. I, I think I was I was grilling with questions before. <laughs> I just want to make sure before I jump in. Yeah, you know, this is this is a big question. But that we ask all of our guests at the end of our episode. I hope we haven't forgotten to do that recently. <laughs> um, but what does embodiment mean to you? What does we it forgot mean? to say that. <laughs> oh, shit, we did. I knew it. I felt in my head that... Whatever, right. now he's answering. Yeah, so what does embodiment mean to you? Good question. I think um, to embody, right, embodiment to embody, is to really own. Yeah. Right? You you own yourself. You own your surroundings. You own your circumstances. Yeah. So if, you're, if you truly embody who you are, you own every decision you've made. And it, and it kind of goes back to that thing of like, you know, that, that glorifying victim mentality. If you get rid of that victim mentality and you own every decision you've made, then you're you're gonna go far, right? Like you take responsibility and 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 sky's the limit. Last thing, yeah. last, last, last thing. 
Cameron, where can people find you? Because I already know you're going to have some fans here that want to follow you, that want to keep up with your journey. Well, I appreciate that. Um, Look at the camera for this one oh. so we can clip it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, so if you guys want to follow me, I'm pretty omnipresent. Um, so I will let you choose the platform in which you'd like to uh, follow me. You can basically find me anywhere on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Type in Cameron Manning or Cameron E. Manning, and you'll find me almost anywhere. Uh, I do have a podcast as well, if you're okay with me pitching that. I got to get better. You guys you guys, you guys guys are really doing an awesome job with your podcast, by the way. And I just want to thank you guys for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. We've been waiting to do this. We have. I'm, 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 I'm excited definitely. that I got to do it with you. And and I will say that you two, as, as interviewers, really impressed me with this. Like, you guys kept a great flow going. You really understand, like, what you want to achieve from the guests. Like, I felt like... Those are really great questions. And I know we you didn't have notes in front of you, so that's fantastic. Um, but my podcast is really about entrepreneurship, mentor, uh, mentorship, marketing, and real estate. And it's the Manning Up on Real Estate podcast. Okay, I love it. Um, play on my last name, obviously. <laughs> and it's always funny because I'm always worried. I'm like, oh, what is like, like the ladies are like, no, but it's actually like three women who came up with the name. So I'm like, all right. Yeah, yeah. But Manning Up on Real Estate podcast. Um, I got to get better at getting more interviews, but we do a lot of great past episodes with great people. Everything from, you know, coaches on Instagram and YouTube to I had a rapper on it. Really? Um, yeah, super cool. I've had your mom a couple of times. Um, your dad's been on my podcast. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So go check that one out. And I am ramping up hopefully for 2024 to start getting more interviews done again. Sam. Woo! Awesome. And we will be listening. This and will not be the only episode that you come on embodiment either. Oh, no, I appreciate that. The beginning. So. Exactly. We're going to probably have a lot of people asking for you to come back. <laughs> well, I appreciate so that. Perfect. And I, I'm glad that you guys felt that it was uh, it was good content for you then. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank you, Cam. Thank yeah. you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Taking time to sit Excellent. with us. Couldn't be more happy to do it for you guys. Yay. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can write to us at embodimentpod at gmail.com. And if you want to send us a DM, it's at embodiment.pod. Or if you'd like to follow us or message us personally on Instagram, it's at emmanuelseries and at ashley.fry. I'm Ashley. And I'm Mano. And you've been listening to Embodiment, who you are behind closed doors. Thank you guys. Have a beautiful day, babies, and I am so grateful for you.